How do you follow that, right? <laughs> well, it is good to be here, and I, I agree. On a Valentine's night, um, you're all here. Look at you. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, you know, I... Uh, <sighs> Every time I preach this, this message God gave me a little while ago, and every time I preach it, I feel like it's just one of those hectic times, and I kind of struggle with it a little bit, and I keep thinking, maybe this, and then I was literally standing right there, and the Lord's like, this is, I need you to preach this. <laughs> it, it feels simple, but to be honest with you, I really feel like this is something that if we can get in our spirit, it's actually going to change your life. Because sometimes simple is, is good, Right? Sometimes simple is good. You guys get a lot of good teaching here. You get a lot of good word. We love uh, your pastors. Uh, they bring in great people, and you guys are so full. So, you know, you have this thought like, what are we going to give to them that they don't already have? <laughs> but you know what? I really feel like the Lord has given me something, something simple. I'm going to pray. We're going to get into the word, and we'll see where it goes because he's, he's supposed to end this thing, so we'll see. <laughs> Tag team, never done this before. <laughs> God, I thank you for tonight. God, I thank you for every one of these people that have come out, Lord God. God, that means that they have put you first tonight. And God, whenever we put you first, God, you take notice. And God, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that there is no trouble, there is no difficulty, there is no mountain too tall, too, too high, that you cannot move, Lord Jesus. And God, I believe that there's some people here that's believing for some miraculous, big, big things. And God, you are a big God that takes care of those things. And God, I thank you that you are here and you are going to do do the work. Amen. Amen. Philippians 4, verse 6. Very familiar. I usually read out of the New, uh, New, King, or New Living Translation. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. I love the word of God because the word of God, it, it, it's so cool because you know, it tells you what to do, and then it tells you what's going to happen. And it's, I love the thens and the buts in the Word of God. <laughs> so it says, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ. I want to stop right here and tell you, you're used to my husband. He's a fiery preacher. I'm a teacher, okay? That's just who I am. That's what I can't be anything else. I'm not going to try to be anything else, but that's who I am. I, I get into the word and I just kind of break it down. And, you know, I think that many times in our circle, we get the praying down. We get, and, and I, I need you to hear me right from the start. In no way am I telling you tonight that prayer is not important. It's very important. The Bible says pray without ceasing. We need to pray. We probably, many of you here just came out of a season of fasting and prayer. You need to fast and pray. It's not just a January thing. It needs to be a lifestyle thing, a continual thing. It needs to be, a, this is a side note, it needs to be a personal thing. You know, we do corporate fasts. That's wonderful. That's fantastic. But that's not it. It shouldn't stop there. You should continually fast and pray. But the question I want to ask you tonight is, what do you do when you're done praying? And that's kind of, when I prepared this message, to be honest with you, I prepared it right after the fast. And it literally was, that was the question that came, what do you do now? You know, sometimes we make such a big thing about one certain thing and then we get all fired up and we get all pumped up and then we walk out of that season and then you go to work and then you live your life and then you do day to day and and very easily you could get into the routine of what you did before that season right anybody been there anybody live real life right and the thing is is after january 21 what do i do i've prayed about it I've given it to God. Now, am I going to pick it back up and worry about it again? You know? Because it's easy to do. You know, you're not focusing on that powerful prayer and fasting time and, and, and you leave it. But I'm asking you, what do you do? And God gave me one simple thing. You praise. I told you it's not going to be profound. You praise. 
You literally, and I'm not, this is wonderful. This is needed. 20 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes before we preach, it, you got to do it. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about coming in Sunday morning and lifting your hands and praising. I'm talking about getting up Monday morning and going, I praise you, Lord. I thank you, Jesus. It's, it's Monday morning. It's Tuesday morning. Sorry, kids, I'm going to say it. It's when the kids are fighting. <laughs> <laughs> it's when you're late for something. It's in the middle of stress. And all of a sudden you're driving down the road and you see a sunset and you say, that's my God. Praise you. You say, well, that's too simple. You know, little wars were won in the Old Testament because of praise. <laughs> It seems too simple, and you think, but God, there's got to be more. And he's saying, no, because I am worthy of that praise. And when you begin to praise in Psalms, it says very simply that you are holy. You are enthroned in the praises of your people. That's, what, that's the God. You know, you know, you praise, and he shows up. He steps in. And, and, and so... After we pray, after we've given that thing to the Lord, I can guarantee you, and I'm not saying this in lack of faith, I'm saying this because many of your prayers are futuristic. Maybe many of your prayers haven't been answered. I know mine haven't because I prayed about their spouses. It hasn't been answered yet, and that's okay. But you know what? I'm going to praise God now and say, God, I thank you that wherever that child is, that's 12 or 9 or 10, that you're leading them to the right path. So when they meet them at whatever age, 45, 50, then they'll be ready for them. <laughs> you get it? You get what I'm saying? You know, I, I get that, that we serve a mountain-moving God, and I believe in the miraculous, and I believe God answers quickly, but I believe some prayers take some time just because that's what it is. You know, we're praying for ministries. We're praying for open doors. We're praying for souls to get saved. We're praying for God's leading. And we're praying and we're praying and we're praying. And then sometimes we got to just stop and say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. You did it. You're working on my behalf. I can't see it. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm ready. You know, we experienced that this week. We had some stuff going on, and all of a sudden, he gets a phone call today, and it's like, thank you, God. That's the answer. And you just begin to praise. But what I'm asking you is, are you living a lifestyle, a lifestyle of praise? You know, I lived in Massachusetts. I lived in Rhode Island. I drove on these streets. I know it can get frustrating. I know life isn't always easy, and it's really not the devil. It's just life, <laughs> you know. And sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the everyday and forget about the God that we serve. And, you know, in Romans uh, 1, 18, it begins to talk about, it actually is talking about sinful people. And they, and they get caught up in the world. But I was reading this the other day, and, I, and it kind of just caught me. And it said, and this is verse uh, 20. It says, they knew the truth about God because he made it very obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. It's very hard to deny that there's not a true God. And they knew God. And through everything that God made, they could clearly see him. So there was no excuse for not knowing God. But listen to what, they, what, it, what the word says. It says that uh, they knew him, but they wouldn't worship him. And they weren't thankful. Wow. Wow. I know God. You know God. You know what? The devil knows God. <laughs> but do you worship him? Are you thankful for him? So you say, Marianne, how do I do that? How do I do that? You know what? You need to know who God is. You, they said they know him, but they didn't, but you got to know him. How do I know him? I got to look at who he is in his word, in his word, throughout his word. You got to know him. In the Old Testament, names are extremely important. And we know the name of God is Jehovah, right? Do you know what that means? It means always was and always will be. So Jehovah always was and always will be. And then you read through the Old Testament and God gives himself some names. Jehovah Elohim, the eternal creator. The always was and always will be the creator. Maybe you need a creative miracle. 
he doesn't stop creating. So praise Jehovah Elohim. I need a miracle. Jehovah Elohim. That's who he is. I know him. I worship him. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. That's who he is. Worship Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Nisi, our banner. Shalom, our peace. All of these are the names of God. And if you can get that in your spirit, when you need it most, you begin to praise who he is. So not only do you know him, but now you're worshiping him. And now you're thanking him. You know, Jehoshaphat brought his whole army before out in, in battle. And he was saying, you know, God, I'm scared. I don't know what I'm going to do. He had called a fast. They got out of the fast. And all of a sudden, somebody gets a word in his, in his circle. And this is what they say. Just start praising God. And you know what? Sometimes we have to just start praising God. And you know what literally happened that day is the armies came out. And they looked up and they saw Jehoshaphat's army was praising the Lord. And it confused them. And then they start fighting against themselves. And I want to tell you, and if you can get this in your spirit, when the enemy sees that you should be complaining, grumbling, worrying, upset, mad, but he sees you worshiping, praising, being thankful, lifting him up, coming to church on a Valentine's night, it confuses him. And then all of the sudden God shows up. All of the sudden God says, that's the person I can, I can work on their behalf. That's the person that I'm going to do this for. And I don't know what you're here tonight believing God for, whether it's for yourself, for your family, for your children. But I believe that tonight, as you allow the Spirit of God to create true praise inside of you, chains can be broken, walls can fall down, and whatever that battle is, is gone because your enemy gets so confused and God shows up on your behalf. You know, I know it's simple, but David had it. And David was a man after God's own heart. Was David perfect? No. But you know what David did? He praised the Lord continually, 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 every day, whatever was going on, he continually praised the Lord. And I'm going to challenge you tonight. My husband's going to come and he's going to take this tag team, but I want to leave you with this. After you're done praying, praise, just praise. Don't pick it up. Praise. I pray this has been a blessing to you. I'm going to tag out. <laughs> Amen. I tagged her. And uh, I thought she was going to go on for a little bit longer than that. So I, I got the floor for a while. Look at that. Got it for another two hours. Praise the Lord. And uh, I'll be honest with you. I'm still a little bit on, uh, I'm on African time over here. Uh, over there would be like, uh, what's 8 plus 5? I didn't, <laughs> I didn't pass math class. Uh, 13, right? 1 o'clock. So it would be like 1 o'clock in the morning over there. And I had a hard time sleeping there because it was very hot. Uh, I would get out of the shower, and 15 seconds after I got out of a cold shower, I was already sweating up a storm. And, uh, but me and Mary did a good job. And, uh, you know, praise. Praise is something more than just uh, us taking up 45 minutes of, of service. You know, praise is literally, when we begin to praise, God goes to battle for us. Uh, what does the Bible say? David said, God inhabits in the praises of his people. I tell people all the time, you know, uh, all you, need, you, you don't have a fear problem. You don't have a sickness problem. All you have is a praise problem. Because if you will learn how to praise God, you can get God to show up in the midst of your situation Anytime, anywhere. You can be inside your car. You can be at the Walmart. How many of us know sometimes we need Jesus at the Walmart? And uh, I say it all the time. <laughs> There's a lot of crazy people at Walmart at 1130 at night. When I was a young boy, 18 years old, and 18 is a boy. I realize now that at 43 years old, 42 years old. And, uh, but I remember when I was 18, I used to work at Stop and Shop. How many have ever heard of Stop and Shop, a grocery store? And, uh, and this is before my kids are not even going to know this, but this is like before I got saved, I would stock the frozen, uh, frozen food department up, and I'd have like a cigarette hanging out of my mouth. I remember one time uh, my boss called me, and you got to stop smoking, 
marinate while you're working. I said, I wasn't smoking while I was working. Come on, you're going to stand there and say you weren't? I, I wasn't smoking. I don't know what you're talking about. Here, come with me. I walk into this room, and it has like 50 television screens, and they, they caught me on the camera. And so, yeah, so I, I lied. Thank God for grace. <laughs> Amen. And, and I got saved. So I don't do it. I, don't, I, I try not to lie, and, and I certainly don't smoke anymore, and, uh, and I don't get high anymore. Praise the Lord. And, uh, but anyway, so, you know, praise be to God. And, and I, I feel like the Lord dropped the word of my spirit for you all today. Now, if I could title this, uh, usually what I, how I would title it would be four attitudes for success. How many people want to walk a successful life? I want to walk a successful life. I want to live a successful life. And you know what? God wants us to be successful and God wants to pros- God wants us to prosper in everything that we do. And I have Really, I have four simple points. I don't know if I'm going to get through the four points uh, tonight. But the four simple points that I have, and as you listen to this, if you have your Bibles with you, if they want to put it up on the screen, I'm going to read Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And I'm going to be reading that out of the New Living Translation. But the four simple points that I have for you, very simple. You know, I believe in the simplicity of the gospel. My wife said something about about praise. She says it's very simple. But, you know, how many of us know that the gospel ought to be very simple? Very simple. I think I, I think when I was here the last time, I told you that I was listening to Dr. Billy Graham, and he said, when you look at the life of Jesus and you read about Jesus in the Bible, you'll notice that Jesus, number one, he spoke with simplicity. Uh, and the Bible says he also spoke with authority. And then the Bible also says that, you know, if we read it, we notice that Jesus used, used stories uh, to, drive, uh, to drive certain principles home. And, and so that's what I'm going to do. I've made up my mind. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow the model that Jesus left behind. How many of us know that the model that Jesus left behind is always the best model uh, to, to follow? And so, but the points that the Lord had dropped into my spirit, like I said, very simple. It's number one, don't settle in life. You know, too many people are settling in life. Number two, understand that God is your source. You know, sometimes we like to look to people, we like to look to jobs, we like to look to whatever it is, that how, however we make an income, we like to think that that's our source, but that's not our source. God is our source. Number three, it's already done. And you may, well, what do you mean it's already done? And I'm just going to, the short version of it is this, and I'll probably go into it a little bit more. But Paul, if we read in the Bible, Paul never prayed. Paul's prayers were always prayed from a perspective of it's already done. And he always prayed, let us have an understanding of what Christ has already accomplished. And let me just say this. When we understand what Christ has accomplished already for us, I'm telling you, you will never taste defeat in your life ever again. You know, when you understand that the battles of life have already been won, that, the, that Jesus, uh, you know, the, the battle is over. Jesus has been raised from the dead. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And right now, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, seated at the, heavenly, uh, at, at the right hand of the Father. And we're seated in heavenly places with the Lord. When you understand everything that has been done, you can't lose in life. You can't. And number, number four is be a doer of the word of God. Now, the Lord has really been driving that into my spirit over the last year and a half. Be a doer. Don't just be a talker, but be a doer of the word of God. Can somebody say amen to that? Now, Acts chapter 3, I'm going to read from verses 1 through 6. Now, normally, from this text that I'm going to be reading out of, I would normally speak on... Uh, the subject of expectation. But today, I want to share with you something that the Lord dropped uh, into my spirit to share with you. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Listen to what the Word of God says. Peter and John, they went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, there was a man lame from birth who was being carried in. Each day, he was put beside the temple gate, the one called Beautiful Gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. Now the layman looked at them eagerly, expecting some money. 
But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold. Now, I want you to pay attention to what Peter said because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this back up here in a few moments. But he said, I don't have any silver and I don't have any gold for you. But he said, what in the, uh, but, what, but what I have, I will give unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Now, what the Lord dropped into my spirit when I was reading this, and one thing that you will understand about me, if you haven't already figured it out, I'm not the type of preacher that I'm going to go word by word, scripture, scripture by scripture, and break down what the word means in the Greek or in the Hebrew. Uh, what, how the Lord speaks to me, and when he revealed certain things to me, is he just drops like little nuggets of truth into my spirit, and then I just, you know, I flow on that. And so if there's anything, after reading this text, if there's anything that I believe that will keep people living below their privileges in Christ or keep them from fully walking uh, out the purpose of God for their life is when they settle for anything other than God's best for their life. So if there's something that I could leave you with tonight and encourage you with is that don't settle for anything other than God's best. Don't settle for less. Don't settle for being mediocre today. Don't settle for being a cheap imitation or a carbon copy of someone else. But let me encourage you with this thought tonight. Strive for God's best for your life. Don't strive for second place. You weren't made to come in second place. You were made for first place. You were made for the best of what God has to offer for you. David said, I'm confident I will see the goodness. I will see the best of what God has to offer while I'm here in the land of the living. You know, sometimes we want to say, well, when we get to heaven, we'll experience the best of what God has for. But the only people that say that are the people that are not experienced the best of that God has for them right now. So they try to push it off to something in the, in the near future. But my friend, let me encourage you with this. If Christ died for it on the cross, you don't have to wait till you get to heaven, but you can enjoy the blessings and the benefits of what Christ has already accomplished for you. Well, one day when we get to heaven, we'll be fully healed. There'll be no more sickness, no, no more disease, no more poverty. And praise be to God, there'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more disease. There will be no more poverty. There will be no more child abuse. There will be no more medication and pills and shots and all these things that we got to take while we're here on this earth. But we don't have to wait till heaven to experience the divine power of God. Right now, we can experience the healing power of God overall. Even better than experiencing the healing power of God, we can experience the divine health that he has already prepared for us. You can live on this earth without going through sickness sickness and disease. Well, people, well, that's just not normal. It's not normal. It's, it's not natural. It's supernatural, but we are not a natural people. We are a supernatural people. The problem is we've been living in these natural bodies in this natural world for so long that we tend to forget that this, the spirit realm is even more real than this natural realm. And we're really not just but humans having a divine or a spiritual experience. We literally are spirit beings that God has given us the privilege to experience a natural realm. And praise be to God that while we live here in this world, even though we may be in this world, we are not of this world. We, the Bible says that we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And praise be to God, we operate by a different set of rules. And we don't strive for second place, but we strive for the very best that God has for us. Can somebody say amen to that? Now, I remember when I was in Bible college, College, I knew people who were called into ministry and they had great potential. But you know what happened to them? They settled. They settled for less. They, didn't, they settled for anything other than God's best. Instead of chasing after the best that God had for them, they settled for the less. And they ended up doing something that they were never called to do. And you know what's happening? They're doing something they were never called to do, and they're struggling while they're doing it. And let me just say this. Nothing good ever comes out of settling for less. In Genesis chapter 25, Esau trades his birthright as the firstborn son, and he forfeits the blessing that would have been his. You know what he forfeited it for? He forfeited it for a measly bowl of lentil soup. I'll tell you what, if I'm going to give something up, 
I'm not going to give it up for lentil soup. I may give it up for a honey glazed donut from Dunkin' Donuts, but I'm not going to give it up for lentil soup. And the reason, let me just say this, the reason many people find themselves in the position that they are in is because they settled. You know, when I was in Bible college, there were many people with great potential, but they settled, and now many of them are doing nothing for the kingdom of God, and even many of them have even left the faith. They settled. They settled for a cheap thrill. They settled for a quick hookup. They settled for being uh, comfortable. They settled for compromise. And if I could be honest with you tonight, some settled with who they were going to marry and where they were going to live. And let me just say this. If you're in here and you're not, ma- not married or you're getting married or you want to get married, who you marry and where you live will either make your life slash ministry very fun or very miserable. So that's why the best place to be is in the center of God's will. You know, I, I was preparing this message. I was in my, uh, in my TV studio in my office, actually, and this thought came to my mind. You can, be, you can be married to the ugliest person on the face of the earth and live in the worst city in America. But if you're in the middle of God's will... Even with an ugly spouse, you can live a blessed life. Okay. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Amen to that. Even with an ugly spouse, you can live a blessed life. Back, I told this to the Bible kids the other day when I was at Faith Bible College up in Charleston. And and I had them all repeat after me. I said, say this after me. Say, I will not marry a loser. And, uh, and if you have married a loser, then tough luck. You're stuck with him or her. <laughs> Back in 2007, when my wife and I were getting ready to, to move, uh, and I knew that the Lord was calling us away from the state of Massachusetts, but when, he, when we were getting ready to move, I really wanted to move to Virginia Beach. And I'll tell you why I wanted to move to Virginia Beach. Two reasons. Number one, I hate the snow. I hate this. I hate. I hate the weather. I hate. You know, people. They were in. When I was in Africa, they were like, "I said, man, how do you guys do it? This is so hot here. How oh, we get used to it?" I said, "That doesn't make any sense. That's like me. You know, back in New England. Man, it's so cold. How do you do? I get used to. It. You can never get used to this weather. Uh, give me like 76, 80 degrees. I'm down with that. But I want. I wanted to move to to Virginia Beach because I hated the weather. And honestly, I had an older brother that lived down in Virginia Beach. But you know what? If I had to move down to Virginia Beach, it would have been for all the wrong reasons, and I would have been settling. But instead of settling, you know what I decided to do? I decided to choose the will of God, and I moved up to the state of Maine. They call that God's country. I decided to not settle. I moved up to the state of Maine. Why? Because I would rather endure the cold weather and be in the center of God's will than to have beautiful sunny weather every day and be out of the will of God. Now, I'll be honest with you. When I was back here, I think like a month ago, I don't even know if it was less than a month ago, uh, we... I. We had a Saturday night service, and then Pastor Brian said, you know what? We're going to hold, uh, we're going to ha- have service on Sunday morning. And I thought to myself, I'm like, man, I was just, look, we were getting like 15 inches of snow. And I thought, I, I was like, who's going to come out? Nobody's going to come out. And, uh, but I was like, Pastor Brian, if you want me to go and preach, I'll go preach to the seats. And, uh, and so I came out, and we had about 50 people that came out. Well, you may say, well, that's not a lot of people compared to what we usually have on a Sunday morning. No, it's not a lot of people. But most churches in America, uh, especially in New England, they don't even have 50 people in their church. And I've preached to churches of like two, three, and four people Uh, so many times that I've learned how to preach based on the integrity of God's word and not based on the response that people will give. Brother Shuttlesworth told me this. He said, if you can't preach to five people, you'll never be able to preach to 500 people, uh, 500 people. And so I learned how to preach in those small services. And the Bible says, despise not the day of small beginnings. And so you think I was happy going to a church with four people? I remember one time the pastor said uh you know he says we want you to come but COVID is is happening and uh, and he said 
Uh, so I, we just want you to know that there may not be a lot of people here, but there will be a lot of people online watching the service. So I remember getting up, getting to the church, and really there wasn't a lot of people there. There was four people there. And I thought to myself, man, I'm going to preach to four people. And then, as he was talking, he said, you know, we may be small in number here, but we have multiple people that are watching the service online. So I said, well, I'm going to keep myself encouraged. And I'm going to take my phone with me and I'm going to put it on the pulpit so I, I could at least see that there's like 60 or 70 people that are watching the service. So I, I have the live stream going on right on the pulpit next to my Bible. And I took a quick glance at it. You know how many people were watching the service? One person was watching the service. You want to hear something even more funny? The one person that was watching the service was sitting in the service with me. And I thought to myself, I was like, what do you mean there's 60 or 70 people watching? But you know, what I have learned how to be faithful in the small and because I have learned to be faithful in the small God has opened up the door for us to travel overseas I'm telling you we preached to thousands of people while we were in Africa and, and we saw hundreds of people come to know Jesus Christ as Lord even before we even got there they had the street team out evangelizing and over 200 people in a matter of two days in the streets of Ghana, Africa, came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. So people were already getting saved before we even got there. You know why? Because there was people like this church that were praying for God to move in that nation. And I'm telling you, when you begin to pray, things begin to happen. Prayer changes things. People say, well, I just feel like nothing's ever changing. Then learn how to pray. Because when you pray, you compel the power of God to go before you and to remove every opposition and every obstacle that stays in your way. Can somebody say amen to that? But the reason a lot of people, the reason a lot of people find themselves out of the will of God, you know why? It's because they have settled in life. That's why the first attitude that we must have as sons and daughters of God is don't settle for less but seek God's best. You know what Paul said? Paul said, seek ye earnestly the best gift. And the best gift is the gift that you need for the moment. It's not the gift that you want for the moment. The best gift is the gift you need for the moment. Because sometimes what you want is not what you need. And sometimes what you want, how many have ever learned this, is really not God's best for your life. In verse 5, for example, in verse 5 of our text, it says that the man was expecting money. But at that moment, I would suggest to you right now, you may think that that's what he needed, but I would suggest to you money was not God's best for him. And I'll show you why I say that. In most translations, we read Peter's response when he says, Silver and gold have I not, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. But if you will read the Syrian translation, it words what Peter says like this, Silver and gold you don't need, but what you do need I have. Let me say that again. Silver and gold you don't need, but what you do need, I have. What Peter was telling that man who sat beside the gate every day was, he was telling him, what you want is not God's best for you right now. God's best is what you need. And what you need, I have. Because what I have will not only take care of you now, but what I have will also change your situation permanently. And what Peter had at that moment, it was the gift of faith. What the man wanted and what the man needed were two different things. Now, I know I'm always picking on my mother-in-law, and uh, a lot of times when I pick on my mother-in-law, uh, her daughter is not standing in front of me uh, or sitting in front of me. But my mother-in-law, she has, every time I say I want something or every time I say I need something, my mother-in-law has this habit of saying, now, now, Nate, do you need or do you want? And honestly, I want to say to her, need, want, what's the difference? I'm not asking your opinion. But honestly, can I be honest with you? There's a big difference between what you need and what you want. Because sometimes what you want is not always what you need. But even more so, sometimes what we want is not God's best. 
When you live with a want mentality, you know what the Lord showed me? When you live with a want mentality instead of a God's best mentality, you are never satisfied. And you're always left wanting the next big thing. Now, I love watches. I really, and I'm not saying that so that you can give me a watch. I'm not, I love watches. I really, and I told my, I just bought a watch. Like, it was like a few months ago. I just bought a watch. Did I need the watch? No. Did I want the watch? Yes. So I bought the watch. And, you know, two weeks right after that, I saw another watch, and I told my wife, I said, I'm going to get that watch too. You know what happened? I bought, I bought something that I really didn't need. I bought something that I wanted. But you know what? Because I bought something I wanted, I thought, hey, you know, I'm good for now. But no, I wasn't good. You know what it left me? It left me wanting the next big thing. In the same case with this guy in Acts chapter 3, day after day, he went to the temple looking for the want and not the need. He went looking for men's best to see what they could do and what they could give him. And even though this man went to the temple, modern day translation, we can say he went to church. This man went to church every day and not once, not once do we read about him looking to God for the answer. Why? And you know, the Lord showed me this. I'm telling you, it's going to hit some of you right now. And uh, this is what the Lord showed me. He says, the reason that this man didn't, we don't read about him uh, ever once asking the Lord for help is because this man became more focused on the men of God and on what they had instead of on the God that Peter and John served. Let me say, sometimes we can be so man-focused instead of God-focused. Now, listen, I'm not saying that we shouldn't honor men and women of God. Yes, we should honor them. But what I am saying is this. Don't ever make Nate Pimentel the object of your faith. Because I'll be honest with you. Nate Pimentel, other people, that they have the potential to let you down. I have the potential to fail you in life. But can I encourage you with something? God will never fail you. God will never disappoint you. It's all right to honor great men of God. But don't ever allow men of God to be the object of your faith. Jesus is the object of our faith. Can somebody say amen to that? The Bible says he was expecting money. Now you may say to yourself, well, what's so wrong with him expecting money? This man was poor. He had no job. He had no food. He was in desperate need. What could possibly be wrong with him wanting a little bit of help? And so... I'm going to show you what could possibly be wrong with this man wanting a little bit of help. What the Lord showed me also was, and listen, I've heard messages on this text plenty of times uh, on the power of expectation, and I've preached on the power of expectation myself. But recently the Lord showed me something about this man. This man's expectation was on the temporary fix of life. His expectation was on the quick fix. His expectation was small. And what God showed me about expectation is that when you have small expectation, you know what happens? You will always be focused on the quick fixes. So if I can encourage you tonight with something would be this, have big expectation. Because God doesn't want to do something small in your life. God wants to do something big in your life. A.A. A. Allen, how many people have ever heard of A.A. A. Allen, old tent preacher? He would say things like, if you will believe big, think big, speak big, and do big, then God will do big in your life. Don't aim small, but aim high in the mighty name of Jesus. You know, my wife and I, in the... A few years ago, well, I said a few years ago, a couple of years ago, we ended up buying a dog and uh, a golden retriever. You know what they said? Buy a golden retriever. It'll be really fun. And uh, you know what's even more fun than a golden retriever? Two golden retrievers. Uh, Brother Shuttlesworth and Sister Judy, uh, they went somewhere and they left their retriever with us. And so we have Daisy and, uh, and we had Biscuit. And those two dogs, I'm telling you, worse than my kids, constantly fighting and playing with each other all over the place. Jealousy, you can't pet one dog without the other dog, like, getting crazy. And uh, But golden retrievers, they are very wild. I could be gone for a month, and when I get home, Daisy will run to me, and she'll, like, jump in the air, 
throw her legs up, get on her back, wants me to rub her belly. I'm like, ah, you know, I've been gone for a month, and so she misses me. But I could go to the garage for two minutes and then come back inside the house, and she acts the same exact way, <laughs> like she hasn't seen me for like a month. And, uh, and so when we have visitors that come over to our house, uh, you know what we've done? When they, we have to get like a bone, and we have to give it to her. But, and she'll take that bone, and she'll go to the next room, and she will spend hours chewing that bone. And the reason I give her the bone, the reason Mary Ann gives her the bone, is you know why? It's because uh, we just assume that dogs love bones. And so what we do, I'm cheap, and I don't want to pay the money for a trainer to train her to act normal. So you know what I do? I go for the quick fix. I get a bone. I'm like, Daisy, I got a bone. And she looks at it, and we throw it in the room, and she will spend hours in that room chewing up that bone. And we give it to her because we just assume that dogs like bones. But honestly, dogs really don't, don't love bones. You know what they love? They love steak. They settle for the bones. The problem in the body of Christ is we have settled for the bones when God says, you can have steak. And that's exactly what we see happening here in Acts chapter 3. This man who was sat by the gate, he was settling for the bones. He was settling for the temporary quick fix. And the only thing the temporary quick fix does, you know what it does? It delays the inevitable in your life. My wife and I, when we bought this house, uh, we need, I have four acres of land. And I had a push mower, 16-inch blade. And I went out there to go mow the grass for the first time. It took me eight hours. I wasn't even, I hadn't even mowed like a quarter of the property. My legs were aching. Every part of my body was hurting. And, uh, and so we needed a lawnmower. Make a long story very short, that summer, my wife and I were believing for a lawnmower, and our neighbors came up to us. And uh, they said, listen, we don't want to offend you and we don't want to offend your husband, but we have a lawnmower that we'd like to gift to you guys if your husband doesn't get offended. And uh, my, my wife's like, oh, no, Nate's not going to get offended. And, uh, and so they gave us the lawnmower. They said, there's only one problem with this thing. And they said, there's a, uh, there's a slow leak in the back tire. Well, I was too cheap to get that tire fixed. So I went after the quick fix. So you know what I did? At Walmart, they sell like this tube of green slime that you can put into the tire. It's really meant for a bicycle. It's not meant for a lawnmower, you know? So I went and bought. I said, man, if, if this is for a bike, I said, I probably need like four or five bottles of these things. So I went and bought like four or five bottles of those things. And then I just started squeezing the green slime into the, into the tire. Well, I'll be honest with you, it worked. And so I, I filled the air up. I was like, oh, this is, this is good. And so anyway, so I mowed the grass. Well, a week later, I needed to mow the grass again. And you know what happened? I look at the tire, and it's flat. So I said, oh, okay. I said, I know what I have to do. I went back to Walmart, and I bought another four or five bottles of that stupid thing, and I squeezed it in there, and, uh, and then I mowed the grass again. A week later goes by. Guess what? There's another flat tire. Well, I go back out to Walmart, and I get another four or five bottles of that. And you know what I realized? Because I settled for the quick fix, I had to do a lot more work. Yeah. I had to spend a whole lot more money. Yeah. If I had just hadn't have been cheap and I had dealt with the situation and I would have permanently taken care of the situation, I wouldn't have to keep going back to Walmart. But the problem with the body of Christ is we're so interested in the quick fix, the temporary fix. But God... God's not interested in the temporary fix. God wants a permanent fix. My father, when I was growing up, my father did auto body. And we hated, my father hated working for people in the church. Because people in the church, they were always the cheapest. My father painted cars. This guy wanted his car painted. And my father was giving him a deal. And he said, I'll paint the car for you. How much? $900. There's no way that you can go even back in 1990, whatever, get a decent job, 
uh, on a, on a paint job on a car for 900 bucks. The guy told my dad, the guy told my dad, you're crazy. I'm not going to pay you 900 bucks to do this. So I remember one day I'm walking down my driveway into the street and I see this old Portuguese guy. You know, we, we just uh, like, man, like he, he was, we, that's what we call Portuguese. And, uh, and so we walk out and he's with a spray can painting the car brown. Look at that. It looked horrible everywhere he went. Just like it attracted all eyes, not because it was a good job, because it looked horrible. Like I wouldn't be caught dead driving that piece of junk. And, uh, and that's what like a lot of Christians do. Instead of like repainting it, they hold cars up with Christian bumper stickers. Here's the temporary fix. But God's not interested in the temporary fix. God's interested in a permanent fix. Can somebody say amen to that? And the reason many believers are living below their full privileges in Christ is because they have settled for the temporary quick fixes of life. They have settled for the bones when God said, hey, you can have the stake. They have settled for less. They've settled for being average. But today, I prophesy over your life that your life is not going to be the total sum of quick fixes but from here on out your life in ministry will be the uh, will be a testimony of the favor of God over your life in Jesus mighty name Amen. don't settle for less but strive for the very best that God has for you number two what I want to share with you is this the second attitude you should have is God is my source in Philippians chapter 4 verse 13 we all know that scripture if you're a student of the word of God it says, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. And the problem that we see in Acts chapter 3 was this man was not making God his source. This man had made people and his begging his source. And the problem with making people uh, your source is that eventually their resources will eventually dry up. But you know what the Lord showed me? The resources of heaven will never, ever dry, dry up. I remember when I was in Bible college, uh, it was my freshman year. I was going into my second semester. And in order to go back to Zion at the time, you needed to give a, a down payment for the second semester. You give no down payment, then you can't go back to school. And, uh, and so what happened was I went home and I did what any 18-year-old would have done. I went to my mom. And I asked her for $600, like it was like 25 cents, you know. I said, hey, Mom, can I have $600? But I'll be honest with you. Because of some events that happened in my family, my parents were no longer able to help me and support me and give me the $600 uh, to go to Bible college. Now, I didn't see it then, but I see it now at the age of 42. What I had done is I had made my parents my source. And you know what happened when their resources dried up, they told me, hey, you have to pack up and you have to move back home. But the problem is I knew I was called. I knew I was supposed to be in Bible college. And so when I drove back to campus, I was actually driving back to campus to go pick up my stuff. But as I was driving back to campus, I prayed. I said, Lord, I know I belong here in Bible college. I know you called me. Why is it that I'm lacking the $600 to come back to school. I said, I need you to do something. If I'm called into Bible college, to Bible college and called into the ministry, I need you to show me starting now that you will provide for me. And so I pulled onto campus, you know, ready to go up to my room to go pack up my stuff when the security supervisor of the campus saw me and he waved me down. Now, I used to be a security guard uh, at the Bible college during the night. And, uh, and so we had to lock up and things like that. And because I had experience on that, when the supervisor waved me down, he said, hey, listen. He said, what are you doing on campus? You're not supposed to be here. And I said, well, I got to come back and grab my stuff. I thought I was going to live on campus for the rest of the, uh, you know, during the break. He said, well, listen, he goes, it's a good thing you came back because I got something to offer you. He said, we're, we're short one security guard here at the school. And, uh, and so the school has given me permission to hire somebody for the break. And they said that I could pay them. And, uh, and I said to myself, I said, okay, I said, he says, that's not a lot, but we can give you some money. And I said, well, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, I don't need a lot of money. All I need is a little bit of money. All I need is 600 bucks, you know? And, uh, and I said, how much are we talking here? He said, like I said, it's not a lot of money, but we can give you up to $600 to stay on campus and be a security guard. And it was at that time that I began to realize God is my source. Now, let me just also say this too. God 
could have easily get, sent somebody my way and slapped $600 in my hand. But that's not what God did. You know what God did? He sent me what you call a job. J-O-B. You got these kids that go to Bible college, and uh, there's this one kid in Bible college, right? And uh, they always hear somebody say, you know, if you're called into ministry, you shouldn't be cleaning toilets. And so this is a student at a Bible college. And, uh, and so her job is to be cleaning the toilets. You know, that's her duty at the school, clean the bathroom. She was neglecting her job. Why? I'm not called to clean toilets. I'm called to preach the God. No, you're called to preach the gospel after you leave Bible college. While you're in Bible college, your job is to clean the toilets. Because if you don't clean the toilets, then you know what? You get no money. And if you get no money, then there is no school. And you got to go home. And you got to say bye-bye to a Bible education. Can somebody say amen to that? But God could have easily put $600 in my hand. But he sent me a job. You think I wanted to work? I didn't want to work. I thought I was going to be a carpenter. My dad hooked me up with a job uh, during the summer in between my junior year and senior year to go build houses. The first day, I went out. My brother Marco, hey, how'd you like work? Loved it. Second day, he said, how'd you like work today? I said, awesome. Third day, I said, dear Lord, I hope it rains tomorrow. I don't want to go back to work. <laughs> I wasn't cut for that life. God called me to be a minister. You think I wanted to work when I was in Bible college? No, but I had to do what I had to do. And I prayed. I said, Lord, I need the $600. And he sent me a job so that I could get the $600. And what God showed me was this during that time. Neither my mom, whether it be my mom or the job, what God showed me is neither my mom nor being a security guard was my source. You know what he said? He says, they were just the delivery system. Here's what God showed me about the delivery system and the source. The source is always God. The source is always the same. But the delivery system is constantly changing. Why? And this is what the Lord spoke to me. He says, the reason the source is always the same and the delivery system is always changing is so that you don't stay dependent on the delivery system as the source, but you stay dependent on God as the source. Can somebody say amen to that? God will always use the least expected delivery system to keep you reminded that he is the source. I was going to... Um, Ghana, obviously I'm back, but I have a friend of mine who was buying a ministry building, and he wanted to buy this thing debt-free, pay it in cash. How many of us know that when you pay things off in cash, it's always a lot better? There's no debt. You don't know any man anything, and you can say, this is mine. Like our house, it's our house. Well, it's the Lord's house, but he gave it to us. We're just stewards. Paid off. Our vehicles paid off. The Lord has been good to the Pimentel family. But I had a friend who wanted to buy his ministry building in cash. And so he was on Facebook Live and all these other platforms, and he was receiving an offering. And, uh, and so my wife's like, are you going to give an offering to that? I said, I am. She said, how much are you going to give? And uh, I said, I'm gonna, and I, I don't mind telling you because I already received the harvest from that. And uh, she said, how much are you going to give? I said, I'm going to give $500. And she looked at me, and I thought she was going to say, good job. She looked at me, and she's like, that's it? I said, I mean, that's it. That's a lot of money. I said, I mean, that's it. She's like, that's all you're going to give? And she says to me, she said, how much you got saved up for the Africa trip? I said, I got 2000 saved up for the Africa trip. And uh, I needed 10000 And she said, give the whole thing. I said, what do you mean give the whole thing? Give the whole thing. And you know what she said to me? She said, 8000 10000 What's 2000 more to God? You need 8000 you don't, you don't have it. So you might as well just give what you have as seed and then expect a harvest. And so I agreed. And based on her, you know, she said, give the whole thing. So I gave the $2,000. But I needed $10,000. And I thought to myself, like, man, now I'm like $2,000 behind. I was $2,000 ahead. Now I'm $2,000 behind. But you know what? I went to a church in Pennsylvania. And uh, when I went, there, there's more people here than there was in that church. 
in Pennsylvania. There was like literally like 20 people there. Half of them looked like they were ready to kick the bucket, like 87 years old. Uh, In the natural, I walk in there, I'm like, ain't no way I'm going home with $10,000 from this place. And uh, so I, I, I didn't have the expectation. But man, God slapped me upside the head. So I'm taking an offering, and this lady comes up to me. She's like 78 years old. And she's like, can I give you an offering personally myself? I said, sure. She's like, I'd rather give it to you. And I said, all right. I said, yeah, you can do it. She's like, do you take credit card? I said, I do. I said, we can take credit card. And she's like, well, what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you half credit and half as a check. And I said, okay. And then she said 5000 And I thought to myself, like, I really wanted to jump up, but now I'm like, man, I'm already halfway there. I'm like $5,000 halfway there to everything that we need for Africa. And I said, okay. I said, so I grabbed the credit card machine thing that I had. I said, so you want to put $2,500? on the credit card and the $2,500 check. And she said, no. She said, I want to give you a $5,000 check and a $5,000 credit card donation. And I thought to myself, that was only four days later. And you know what I learned? Husbands, you know what I learned? Husbands, you want, you want some solid advice? Husbands, if what God speaks to you is less than what God spoke to your wife, then your wife is listening to the Holy Ghost and you're not. You're listening to the natural mind. You're operating by feeling. If your wife has a higher amount, then can I go on what your wife is telling you to do? I remember I was at at a West Virginia camp meeting, and I went there to give $1,000 as an offering, right? And then Bishop, how many of us know Bishop Rick Thomas, right? And so Bishop Rick Thomas, on the last night, he's taking an offering, and he says, I want you to do something that you've never done before in your ministry. He said, I want, I want to challenge everybody in here, especially every minister, to give $1,000. Do something you've never done before. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm laughing, and in my mind, you know what I said? I'm sitting there, and I'm like, ha! I got you. I gave $1,000 at the beginning of the camp meeting, and so I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm off scot-free. I don't have to give anything in this offering. And you know what the Holy Ghost said to me? He said, he said do something you've never done before. You've never given $1,000 back to back. I was like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Pastor Brian was actually sitting beside me. And I thought to myself, you got to be kidding me. So you know what I did? I took my phone. You're not supposed to take your phone and text your husband or your wife while the preacher's preaching. But I grabbed my phone, and I, and I texted Mary Ann, and I said, I really feel the Lord's telling me to give $1,000. What I wanted to hear her say was, don't give the $1,000. You already gave the $1,000. You know, I told her, I said, I really feel the Lord wants me to give a, another $1,000 tonight. And, and you know what she said? She's like, was it the Lord? Was it the Lord that told you to do that? I said, yeah, I believe so. And I was expecting to hear her say, well, if you, don't, if you don't believe so, if you're still doubting, then, you know, hold on to it. Don't give it. Then she, you know what she said? She said, so, okay, go ahead and give it $1,000. I'm like, oh, that's not what I wanted to hear. That's not what I wanted to hear. And so Pastor Brian sitting beside me, they're still taking the offering. And I grabbed this envelope, and I filled out the envelope, put my name in it, put the amount. Bishop Rick Thomas is still speaking, and I walk up to the platform, and I throw the envelope inside the bucket, and I walk. Pastor Ryan's like, man, he wasn't even done preaching. I said, listen, if I held off another five minutes, that $1,000 wasn't going in that bucket. (laughs) So I did it. I acted on it quickly. But you know what? And when I gave that $1,000, we needed we needed to pay off for a Ghana trip, and we needed to pay off an India trip. And I didn't have money for any of that stuff. I only had $1,000 left. The last $1,000 I had for the missions trips. And you know what happened? I sold that, went to a church. There was this guy who was listening to us, listening to me preach and hearing about going to Ghana. And he comes up to me after the service, and he says, um, hey, how much do you need for Ghana and for India? And I said, why? He's like, whatever you can't come up with, he says, I'm going to underwrite everything for you. Now, I've heard people say that all the time. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And you know what I've learned? The people who say they're going to do this and the people who say they're going to do that, they never do this and they never do that. If you're going to give to, if you're going to, give to the work of the Lord and you're going to give to them, and you don't have to tell the people that you're going to give it to them. Just give it to them. Just give it to them. I had one guy one time come up to me, and he wanted to give a check in my hand for $1,000. That's $1,000. Like, I'd never seen a $1,000 check before, you know? That's $1,000. But then three months later, he has somebody give me a phone call and say, hey, I want $1,000 back. You know, the Bible says you rob God when you, like, withhold your tithes in your offer. I don't even know what you call when you give God money and then say three months later, hey, I want my money back. 
Don't ever do that. That's a sure way. If you're struggling, that's a sure way to even keep on struggling in life. And so, but what I learned is this. When I was there, the guy said, whatever you need, I'm going to underwrite for you. And I thought to myself, well, I heard that before. He said, what do you need for Ghana? And I said, well, I said, I don't even know what the budget is yet. I haven't even looked at it. He took out a smartphone and he priced out a ticket from uh, Boston to Accra. And it was a $4,000 ticket first class. He took out his checkbook and wrote a check for $4,000. This is like two days right after I sold the $2,000 into the kingdom of God. Wrote out a check for $4,000. And then he says, how much do you need for India? And I said, well, I said, that's almost done. And he says, well, the key word is almost, but it's not fully underwritten. And he says, how much do you need? I said, I need $3,000. He took out a check uh, and he wrote another check for $3,000. And then he also wrote another check for $1,000 to support our ministry to be as a partner. For, for the year as if he hadn't already done enough, you know? And in five minutes, he sold $8,000 to the kingdom of God. You know, you know what I wanted to tell him? I wanted to tell him, hey, next year we have also two more mission trips. <laughs> but I felt it was too soon to say something like that, you know? But you know what I've learned? God is our source. When you understand that God is your source, when you see things happening in the natural, how things are in the natural, look, you're not going to be worried. You're not going to go, you know what people like to do? I've seen this. I, 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 know, I know how the game works. I've seen it. People will try to scope out the crowd to see, you know, who looks like they have, that they can bless you with something. You know, the Bible tells us to stay away from acting like that. You know what I'm saying? We try to, we try to be nice to the people that we think, well, maybe the, it's going to come through. And you know what? Most times the delivery system, it's not those people. God likes to use the least expected delivery system so that you can come to the understanding people are not your source. God is your source. Can somebody say amen to that? God is your source. Don't settle for less and understand that God is your source. Number three, have this mindset, it's already done, already done. Like I told you, Paul prayed with an understanding. You know what? Let me, go, let me get to it. Paul prayed. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18, he said, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. And then he said, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Multiple times in the Pauline epistles, Paul prayed that we would understand the scope of everything that God has already done. That we would understand that God has done everything that he needs to do in order for us to walk in victory. The Bible says that Jesus lived, he died, he was buried, he went to hell. says he took the keys of hell, death, and the grave. He was raised back up to life, and he sat down at the right hand of the Father... And and the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 6, that he has made us to sit down together with him in heavenly places so that what comes under his feet now comes under our feet. And through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, everything that we need is already done. Sin is under your feet now. Sickness is under your feet now. Lack is under your feet now. Listen, you name it. If the blood of Jesus Christ paid for it, then it's under your feet now. Right now, healing belongs to us. Right now, victory belongs to us. And we have devil-destroying resurrection power living on the inside of us right now. Can somebody say amen to that? And lastly, I'm going to close off with this. Be a doer of the word of God. The one thing I consistently see in the Bible and what I've seen in my own life is this. When I move, God will move. In John chapter 2, there was a wedding at Cana of Galilee, and they had just run out of wine. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, went up to Jesus and she said, we have no more wine. You know what Jesus' response to his mother was? He said, woman, what does that have to do with me? Now, I tried that with my mom when I was 13. Woman, stop. She just backhanded me. It worked better for Jesus than it worked for me. But you know, Mary's response was the ticket to the supernatural provision that, we, that they were about to see. You know what she said to the servants? Very simple. She says, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. 
in the Nathan Pimentel translation, what she was telling them was, listen, when he tells you to move, then move. The reason some people are stuck in life is because they are not moving. When you move, God will move. I hear people say all the time, just imagine what God would do. Imagine what God would do if we would just do this. Imagine what God would do if we would just pray a little bit longer. Imagine what God would do, as my wife said, if we would just praise a little bit longer. Imagine what God would do if we just lived holy lives. Imagine what God would do if we did this and we did that. But instead of imagining, my friend, could I suggest to you today, instead of imagining, why don't you just do what he tells you to do? Why don't you start doing so God can start doing? Don't just listen to the word of God, but be a doer of the word of God. I'm not just going to talk about giving. I'm going to be a giver. I'm not just going to talk about praying, but I'm going to pray. I'm not just going to talk about praising, but I'm going to be a praiser. Psalms 118 says, songs of joy and victory are sung in the camp of the godly. Can I encourage you with something? God's not looking for talkers. God's looking for doers. Do I have any doers in the house tonight? So here's the word of the Lord for you. Don't be a talker. Be a doer. Don't settle for less. Understand God is your source. Everything you need in life to win the battles of life has already been accomplished. And start moving. Don't sit back and wait for God to move because I'll tell you what, it'll never happen. You've got your part. God's going to do his part, but you've got to do your part. The Bible is a covenant. And a covenant means there's two people involved in that contract. When you do your part, God will do his part. Walk in obedience to God. I told you, I say it all the time. I was going to use my wife's Bible to preach, but it's not very manly. And, uh, but this is God's instructional manual. I've told you multiple times, when you see a believer living a defeated lifestyle and nothing ever goes right for them, they've walked away from the instructions of God's word. God hasn't given us this word. Look at my wife's Bible, completely ripped. She uses it a lot. But you know what? When we, when we do what God's word tells us to do, you'll never fail in life. But you will always experience victory after victory after victory in Jesus' mighty name. Lift your hands. Thank you for watching this broadcast. And before I let you go, I always love to give people an opportunity to sow into what they have just heard. I personally believe that one of the ways to walk in the financial blessings of God is by connecting ourselves financially to soul winning ministries. And today, my friend... I don't hesitate to say that this is a soul-winning ministry, and I would love to have you partner monthly with us. Well, maybe you're here, you're listening, and you're saying, Nate, I don't know if I can partner monthly, but I can sow a one-time seed. So today I'm asking you, ask the Lord how you can be a blessing, and as He speaks, be obedient to His instructions. A few years ago, I began what I call Operation 100K, where we are doing Three things primarily. We are feeding children every day. We're preaching the gospel worldwide in person in our international crusades. And third, we are rescuing young women and children from the lifestyle of prostitution and human trafficking. With Operation 100K, I set my faith for 100 yearly partners who will stand by our side with their gift of $1,000 or more as we reach, help, and rescue those that need it. And as a token of my appreciation, I wanted, to, I wanted to be able to send you this Bible, our ministry partner Bible, uh, that I know will be a blessing to you. And, uh, and as you receive this Bible and as you read this Bible, I pray that you would be reminded of this ministry as we continue to do what God has called us to do. And so listen, my friends, to be a part of Operation 100K or to just sow a one-time gift, you can always go to our ministry website, which is displayed on the screen right in front of you, or you can use any of our other methods of giving that you will also see on the screen in front of you. So my friend, I just wanted to thank you so much for partnering with us as we do what God has called us to do. You, with your giving, through your giving, you're making a significant impact in thousands of lives all across this world. Remember, God's not calling us to just pray about situations 
but he's calling us to be doers. He's calling us to do. He's calling us into action. And by partnering with this ministry, that's exactly what you are doing. You are being a doer of the Word of God, and you are jumping right into the battlefield and fighting the good fight of faith along with us as we make a significant impact in this world for the kingdom of God. Thank you, my friends. I love you. God bless you, and I look forward to hearing from you.